people who are on both sides of that equation. They are incredibly big thinkers who also are really good at the implementation. Uh, and the thing they have in common is the way they do it. Um, interestingly, the tool of choice for these four is media, specifically entertainment, for really making an impact in social issues of our day. Whether that be, as Bono was alluding to, poverty, um, malaria, or homelessness and AIDS. So, um, thank you to our panelists for being here today. And, let's see, maybe I can back everybody out. Um, I'd like to start by introducing each of you, and that will give our audience an idea of who you are, and please be thinking in advance of any questions you may have. We'll have time for Q&A afterwards. So, ladies first, beginning with Buffy on the end. Buffy Shutt is Executive Vice um, President of Marketing at Participant Media, well known for making movies with a message. Uh, you certainly saw a lot of news recently about Lincoln, and less recently, Inconvenient Truth, Good Night and Good Luck, and Syriana. Uh, previously, she was President and, and Co-President of Marketing at both Columbia and Universal Pictures. And we know she did a remarkable job because all of her movies are in our libraries. They include Raiders of the Lost Ark, Apollo 13, Sleepless in Seattle, Philadelphia, and Jurassic Park. <laughs> uh, she has been honored by women in film with their highest honor, the Crystal Award, for good reason. Um, she's also a published author and has taught here at UCLA both marketing and production for those lucky few students. Jonathan, Jonathan here, Jonathan Shestak. I'm sorry that I didn't know everybody's way. Yeah. Thank you. Jonathan is a celebrated producer and autism research advocate. His productions include Air Force One, Disturbing Behavior, Family Man, and Bring It On, to name a few. Uh, and I think his proudest moments are as the founder of Cure Autism Now. Unfortunately, one of his three children has autism, and that inspired he and his wife to create Cure Autism Now, raising the profile of autism through celebrity outreach and grassroots initiatives. Um, this led to incredible um, results, particularly in the federal government with the Children's Health Act of 2000 and Combat Combating Autism Act of 2006. And he continues to serve on, on, on the board of Autism Speaks, which is uh, sort of the the accumulation of many different autism organizations, um, including uh, so also serving on the board of some federal, state, and private research boards, like the $3 billion stem cell initiative that is um, coming out of California. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> Miss anything? Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Uh, Lee Ryerson, to his left, is Chief Operating Officer of Shine America, which produces and distributes TV and digital content and builds brands through integrated marketing. So examples of this would be Biggest Loser, uh, The Office, Ugly Betty, and many uh, shorter programs online, original online series. He has been VP of Business Affairs at ABC TV Network, has practiced law, and gets that degree of a double Bruin coming out of uh, with a BA in economics and a JD from UCLA. He's also a board member of the KCRW Foundation and Hollywood Entertainment District. Thank you, Lee. And lastly, but not least, Peter Samuelson's uh, experience doesn't break down very well into a single paragraph, I'm afraid. He, he's got many experiences as a film producer and serial social entrepreneur. Uh, some titles you'll recognize, Revenge of the Nerds, Wild, as in Oscar Wilde, and Arlington Drive. Uh, and I'd say, in terms of his Bono activism. Today, we'll be hearing a little bit about Peter's uh, experience creating charities for children, both sick children and children in need, through many various nonprofits, including Starlight Children's Foundation he founded, First Star, which he founded, Everyone Deserves a Roof, which he founded, and uh, the Starbright Foundation, which he founded in partnership with Steven Spielberg and General Schwarza. In 1995, they had a social network. Uh, was, yeah, the idea was a virtual playground for kids who are stuck at home or stuck in a hospital and have lost the chance to interact with other children. He's a founding board member of Participant Media and has, was also the founding manager, a managing director of the Media Institute for Social Change at USC, but we'll forgive him because he's also an Anderson guy. <laughs> <laughs> 
So the idea behind TED, right, is that we are hoping to transition these big ideas to actionable ones. So I'd like to hear just from our panelists who have just seen the exact same video you have, also live, uh, with no preparation in advance. What, what are the big ideas you heard out of Bono's speech, and what actionable ideas do you see coming out of it? Sort of what are the things that jump out at you? Well, first, showmanship. <laughs> uh, many people could have stood there and done the same PowerPoint presentation, but Bono does it with a sort of a wonderful larger than life, upside down glasses, sort of makes fun of himself. Uh, he's clearly an enormously creative, amusing, wildly intelligent man. And I think what we often forget in pro-social land is that if you're boring, they won't do it. And he does it in a way that is compelling. And I think that's a principal part of why he has been able, God bless him, to be so successful. Do you think that's because of the credibility he has with the audience that's already built into him? Is it is it a combination of that and how he does it, um, and how he gets the message across? Because I think that's um, important when you're speaking to an audience and trying to get uh, get to what they care about. Is I mean that that happens in live speaking. I think it happens in entertainment media. It happens in you know any kind of news or anybody trying to influence someone. Is um, to really what they care about that maybe they don't realize they care about. And I think he does, I think he does that a lot of the TED speakers do that. Yeah, um, just building on that, I think the thing that struck me and something we spent a lot of time talking about as a participant is he showed the way forward. He showed this is happening, this is good. I think a lot of us are issue fatigued and we just want to pull the covers over our head but if you can model success and model change and show that things are changing, which he did three or four, I think, very dramatic times, I think that's a way to communicate with an audience that, as I said, I think is so bombarded with do good and be good that to show change is within our grasp and solutions are within our grasp, I think is a very smart message. Great, I agree. The message of it's terrible. Uh, I don't know how we got into this situation. We may never get out of it. Uh, come on, everybody, follow me. Isn't going to work. And That's once great. in a while, uh, you have to say, good job. And, uh, and periodically, in a movement, you have to do it. But if you do it too much, then you become a self-congratulatory knucklehead. And that is always what I think we are balancing. Uh, you know, there was this guy, um, Eric Heffer, who was like a philosopher, but he started as a longshoreman, and he was talking about uh, big mass movements, and he says, he said they, uh, they start as a, uh, as a cause, they become a movement, and then they end up as a racket. And <laughs> um, that is, um, you know, Bono, I think, has maybe cut through that in the international aid um, business, and, but he's done it, if he's done it, he's done it by a process of constant self-examination, right? And it is so easy to start out doing something and you look up 20 years and you have become what you hate. Um, and so this, self the self-congratulatory moment is great and important, and then it has to quickly be followed by self-examination. It has to be a constant process or you'll just end up with something that you're not proud of. I thought the way that he structured it was actually very clever because he used optimism at the potential for success by showing what success literally would look like if the line was going down to zero. And then he showed the uh, movement of those lines uh, if there is backsliding. Uh, I, I do think that it's important we do too little of it in uh, pro-social movements uh, in talking about utopia. We psychologists tell us that if you want to persuade someone to do something, uh, you actually should first have them inhabit the goal, because if they inhabit the goal, they might actually want to go there. And I thought he did that quite elegantly, but you're absolutely right. Uh, you can't only talk about that. After inspiring people with achievability, uh, 
you absolutely uh, have to be taught realistically. And I thought he was tactic driven and, and, and that was good. But the, the overarching thing that we don't do very much, which he did, is to show this utopian thing. I remember sitting next to Buffy at the very beginning of Participant, our leader, Jeff Stoll, had to make a speech at Oxford University. We hadn't actually accomplished really anything at all, but we wanted to inspire the audience before he went on to speak. So, and we also had no budget. So we did a two minute, uh, we asked ourselves the question, what would success look like in the eight individual areas that we are trying to affect? And we said, well, if that success existed in 10 years, what would the front page of the New York Times, National Geographic, al Ram, and various other periodicals look like? And we went to some little place in Hollywood and said, you know, with Photoshop, and we said, could you please mock us up these headlines? And interestingly, I remember the one to do with climate change was a picture of Al Gore with his chart of the rising temperatures, except we, we made it go down and we <laughs> lifted the corners of it. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, the, 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 it was an amazing moment because just about everybody in, in the Oxford audience cried and said, yes, we have to do this. You have to grasp it in order to want to go there. One of the things that Helena said that struck me was he, I think he called himself a pacifist. And I thought how elusive facts really are in the, in the media world. I totally like what he's saying. I think he'll be guided by facts and, and, and science and, and all of the disciplines. But with the rise of social media, and I have an example of this with a movie you just did, there is so much out there masquerading as facts. And it's very hard to beat through to find what is fact, what is analysis, what is opinion. And he didn't really address that, but I do think that's a whole piece that's sort of part science denialism and then part, you know, I read it on someone's blog. Well, okay, but where's the sort of, you know. And, and my example is we did a movie um, in December called Promised Land with um, Matt Damon and John Krasinski. I didn't know that. And uh, there was an organization called, you know, Americans for Something, which was really just a front for the petroleum industry who was trying to keep people away from seeing a movie that wanted to talk about transparency in fracking. So I think this is a whole issue. We have to be scrupulous and, and, and look hard. What is a fact? But uh, that movie was whether or not it was successful financially. Oh, you had to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was thinking about it, my stepson was the editor, so we talked about it okay. all the time. Uh, <laughs> is, um, it actually seemed, in general, I think that movies don't uh, set much of anybody's agenda. But in this case, which is just a very specific thing, uh, the mention of that movie, and say the movie with Matt Damon in it, was the door opening to every conversation that anybody wanted to have about fracking for months. And so in that regard, it was successful. It really did allow people to talk about it. Right. And even having like the petroleum industry making up, both, having bogusly type of blogs that then you can talk about. In the end, it actually, you helped create more conversation and more uh, education about this subject. Yeah. I think that's right, because that's the, 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 the quote unquote facts that the petroleum companies will get out versus your movie and your PR and manufacturing of the corporate um, you know, statements. And, and you see it in the comments. So you'll see a blog post, you'll see mm -hmm. an article, and you'll see the comments that happen. And, and w when you get that dialogue going, I think what you, that's what he's talking about is that the, the, the real facts get out there. And once, you, once they're out there, you can't do anything about them. You see that film. You see a film like that and you get angry and, and, and even if it's a small audience of, of people who get angry, those people then go do something about it and they, and they infect other people or influence other people with those ideas of very important work and, 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 and you can do it in a commercial context of running a film company right. and, and, and have it um, be commercially successful too um, or in the slate of things be commercially successful.
I would slightly differ and say that currently the jury is out, uh, and I think there is possibly criticism that should be leveled that we are better in our massive social pressures in expressing what we will no longer tolerate, and we're a little short on the follow through and the nuts and bolts of how to solidify and perpetuate the better things. Um, having said that, uh, I also think what was little overlooked is we tend to talk about social um, media uh, as influencing everyone, the mass audience. But there is actually a recent example just in the last few weeks of given that we have many of our social structures are run by people who are in power, you can actually use film to make them change their minds. The film that was nominated for an Academy Award called The Invisible War, and it didn't win because Sugarman was unbeatable, but nevertheless, to be nominated is something. Um, its victory has nothing to do with the popular audience. That film is about rape in the American military. There are 200,000 women in the American armed forces, 19,000 of them last year complained of being raped, which probably means the real number is much larger. So it's about 10% who, who, who allege rape. Uh, that led to, because the perpetrators were in the chain of command, it led to uh, only 450 formal investigations, which led to 250 convictions, which led to 107 perpetrators being sent to jail. Go figure. Okay, so the film comes out, it costs $600,000 to make, which is not much. Um, the film has so far accomplished the following things. Number one, Leon Panetta uh, has already changed the nature of the investigation uh, within the US military. Number two, he mandated that every unit commander in the US military had to see the film and sign a thing saying they'd done so. Number four, in the hearing confirmations for Chuck Hagel, he was asked about the film. Have you seen the film The Invisible War? Yes, I have. What do you intend doing about it? And he had prepared notes of the five things which, if confirmed, he has pledged to do. Furthermore, there is a full congressional hearing that is now going to happen. I think that film, even though it didn't win the Academy Award, will be able to say mission accomplished. And even though it only really affected the top of the pyramid, may have outraged many of us, but the, the, the 200 people who were in a position to change something will have been forced to change it by that film, which is a very high social ROI <coughs> in my book. Right, and this also comes back to, in this case it wasn't, it was very good targeting, but it reminds us again of Bono and also celebrity, and how uh, the challenge for anybody is, uh, and social media has actually just made it worse in a way, is cutting through the clutter with your message. And um, you know, my experience when we started Your Autism Now, which was like 20 years ago, and at that point, uh, nobody really was talking about autism or was aware of it, and there was maybe 12 scientists working in the field. Uh, the essential thing was getting some celebrities and getting some athletes, and without those kinds of people on board, which we could do because we live down here, we would never have been able to uh, get a hearing in front of the Congress. We would never have been able to get on the local news. We would never have been able to take walks that started with like 4,000 people and turned into 25,000 people times 20. Um, and we were sort of, we were lucky that way, but there is, sometimes it can be the message, but often it is the messenger, and, and the thing that helps you cut through clutter is uh, celebrity, which is of course then just another form of clutter. And <laughs> so, I mean, again, which just leads me back to the message of constant self-examination and making sure all the time that in order to accomplish what you want to accomplish, you are not becoming the thing that you started out despising. And Looking, you might avoid it. You know, we use an example of using celebrity power. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I, I guess we, we had talked about this before, but um, I think you still have to. We still have to. So, um, one of the shows that my company produces, which uh, Alexa mentioned, is the Biggest Loser, and. 
show started out as a, you know, how do you show, how do you use um, uh, television to, um, uh, to show a transformation of someone who needs to lose a lot of weight and get healthy. And a lot of networks were trying to do that, um, and production companies back when The Biggest Loser was developed. And um, this one, man, you know, we managed to kind of crack, crack it with this show. So the show's been on for several seasons, and as that has gone on, we were getting a lot of feedback from our audience about, and, and from the contestants about, this is so great, you know, you, this really works, this, the, you know, the, the health transformation and what it does for people is not only great for the people who are who we show on the, on the show, but for, for you know, many in the audience who watch it. So the show's gone on for some time. So a, a few cycles ago, someone came up with the idea as we were working with our sponsor, General Mills, one of our sponsors, to, um, tie in a program that General Mills had started called Feeding America with uh, The Biggest Loser. And the idea was get, um, make people aware of food insecurity in the United States, uh, but also make them aware of what we were always doing is the, the need to lose weight. And what and the concept was, and I can't, I can't credit any particular person for coming up with this, I'm sure someone did, but the concept was the pound for pound challenge where um, we, uh, through the show, celebrity PSAs that we in integrated into the show uh, encourage people to pledge go to a website, pledge to lose a pound or lose 10 pounds or lose 40 pounds. And for every pound that you pledge to lose, General Mills would donate a pound of food to a food bank in your local area. So the idea was um, there's an obesity problem in the U.S. There's also a food insecurity problem in the U.S. in, in, mo in most areas. And that was a solution where we felt you know, we use the power of the show to both get a sponsor's message out, which you know, kind, kind of you have to do. There has to be a little capitalism in these things to get this out there and use the power of those corporations. But the message was on every cereal box. It was in every Cheerios box. It was on our show every week. And it got out there and people, you know, 13 million pounds of food were donated across the country through this, through this effort, which we, we love the people who work for the company. They love to have that kind of thing associated with the show. A reality show isn't typically the thing that affects the change <laughs> and affects people's you know, behavior, but, but this one did in that small way, and we felt great about that. Um, Pat did a great job of connecting what you saw on the screen to what you could do personally, and I'd love to hear from the rest of you your experience turning the passive experience of watching into an active experience. Well, one of the things that could give everyone in the room enormous optimism for the future is that the demographic wheel is turning. Young people, Gen Y, not just in the United States, but internationally, to an unprecedented degree, several things are ending. Number one, everyone is digital. I work extensively Boston youth who are so uh, impoverished in every way and who have had such dreadful things done to them, they're all digital. They, we, once we gave them their flip cams and their laptops, uh, my UCLA, because they're Bruins, 10th graders uh, living here on campus, uh, if you see them around with their flip cams, they're all digital. Uh, it's their most prized possession. Secondly, this generation of young Americans is the most pro-social in three generations. The number of hours volunteered per month by Gen Y is substantially higher than their parents or their grandparents. You have to go back to the 1930s to find as many hours a month. The third thing is clearly that there is a high adherence to celebrity, to role models in media, and to media itself. Therefore, the opportunity is to present pathways to social progress to all of our young people and also to enable and encourage them through the internet, through YouTube and all the rest of it to fight their corner, to speak and be heard and to do it not by writing op-eds in the newspaper, which people don't read anymore, but to do it through self-generated video, which through the miracles of the internet, uh, you can make
make something. There would be two young men in San Diego, and you can make a film called Coney 2012, and you can actually have it seen by 100 million people in eight days. That is a level of crowdsourced power that has not existed in the history of the world. So there is enormous cause for optimism. There's also cause for optimism in the effect on our corporations, because in the new code poll, 85% of Gen Y will change brands if there is what they consider to be a worthwhile pro-social proposition on brand B. Watch how fast the brands start paying attention to that. So suddenly one, seeing, uh, one sees young people with much more of two hands on a steering wheel of society and with the technology and the creativity and the caring and the passion to actually make the world a better place. I think it's the new democracy. And the oldens who can't agree on you know, where to sit in Washington, I think will fade away. And we will see this new generation come together. It's also a generation because of media, I believe, and connectivity that is much less scared of other. It is a generation that has already seen into the worlds of other types and categories of people and have found them very similar in more ways than they are different. And that bodes well as well. Can you give me an example of something else you're doing in your work connecting passive experience to active experience? Well. Participants' um, business model is to do that, mm -hmm. and, and there's a, a range of ways we do it, and some are wildly successful, some are not so successful. Um, <coughs> there's a, just as a preface to this, because the mentioned to spend a lot of time talking about this, there's a um, social scientist professor at Columbia, Elka Weber, and she has a way of talking about this. She calls it your pool of worry. And she said, there's, only, there's a finite amount of things each of us keeps in our pool of worry. And in the pool of worry is, will I graduate from college in May? And terrorism, and climate change, and the parking meter that's running out. All of these things float in your pool of worry. And what people like us try to do is, how can you make something important enough that it goes into someone's pool of worry? And we did a lot of um, work as a team, and there were a lot of people doing that, so it's just not participant. But around Inconvenient Truth, there's an interesting statistic. So before the movie came out, only 32% of people thought climate change was a real concern. After the movie came out, 82% said they thought it was a concern. But now that number has really eroded. And one of the reasons it's eroded, if I can connect all these dots, is the downturn in the economy. So if you look at what people are concerned about as the economy and the lack and the scarcity of jobs increases, they can't be concerned about terrorism or the environment. They can only be concerned, how am I gonna pay the bills? How am I gonna get the rent, the rent for my home and the car payment? So what I thought was so interesting about what Bono said is he sort of tried to take all of these things that are swirling around and made it about poverty. And I think in some ways that's a very clear message that's something we can relate to and all other issues actually are hooked up to that. Too poor to get an education, too poor to be vaccinated, too poor to go outside your small world. It's, it's really interesting he picked that and I think it was right on the money um, for what's kind of going on right now. We've got about five more minutes. We could either take a question from the audience or if John, you have something that you wanted to close with. No, first I just want to say, I mean, it is, uh, Inconvenient Truth is like the shining example uh, where you actually saw um, a documentary, but a movie sort of completely move the, the needle in public opinion. And you could see it happen uh, within a year's time. And then of course, the other thing that happened was though, its success brought out money working against it, which also worked to steadily, yes. to steadily erode. And 100%. a lot of times, I mean, also, you know, I think 
finding your opportunity is truly important. I mean, when um, say Bono went out uh, initially went after uh, debt relief, there wasn't anybody really against it. There wasn't. It was a shocking idea that you could actually like forgive someone's debts the way that companies forgive other companies' debts all the time. But we don't forgive our student but, loans. But we don't <laughs> do it in other, in other words. It was a shocking idea that no one marshaled against it initially and was able was able to do it. The reason we were able to make a difference um, in autism at the time was the internet was new. We could organize parents in a way that they couldn't, that they had never been able to be organized before. And there was nobody against us. Once there, uh, but eventually there became people against us or uh, when the feds didn't want to spend uh, a lot of money on it, they would try and foment disagreements within the group. It's mm -hmm. all organized a group. But I think it is always like finding the moment in time when you can leap in, when everybody is sort of moving somewhere else, isn't massing against you, and push as fast and far as you can, and then know that there's going to be pushback. But by then you've gotten a group of people who have linked arms with you and will keep keep going. I mean, I really felt, uh, you know, the climate change a year ago was like becoming uh, forgotten and unaccepted. Now I feel like other forces have pushed back, including nature, and it's and it's now part of the battle we're, we're always fighting. Before that movie, right. nobody was fighting that. I, I hope that's right, what you say. I was very disappointed that the two candidates never spoke the word climate change, only stunned and only recently has Obama started talking about it. But what, I think you make a really important, there is there are moments in life and in, in culture where, and, and I think Inconvenient Truth really benefited from that. It was a confluence of a lot of things that made people kind of pay attention. And the, particularly in our documentaries, um, we have a woman, Diane Weirman, who spearheads that. And I call her a future teller, because the documentary takes two to three years to come to the screen. And so you kind of have to make a bet on your filmmaker, but you have to make a bet that what the filmmaker is interested in is going to intersect with what the mainstream public is interested in. And just to pick up on what you said, Friday we have a documentary opening a place at the table about hunger in America. And a lot of the work that we did, we really do see there is kind of a, you know, people are ready to hear that in this country we shouldn't have 50 million people food insecure or one out of four children. Um, so we've got That's cheery. We've got, go, go ahead. I just want to tell you a happy thing, which should be empowering to every young person sitting here. So, and this is such a win. It's a corporate, student, academic, pro-social win. So I got CBS to um, say they would pay for PSAs. Uh, I said to the students, you can pick any subject you like. I don't care. Go find a 501c3 and come up with a cause that you want to make your 30-second piece of haiku on uh, with CBS's backing. So one of our students, Ryan Lipscomb, he comes in and he says, in my community, in African-American America, gang shootings, the statistic that I'm most traumatized by is that one out of every three victims has no relationship to either gang, not the shooter's gang, not the intended victim's gang. It's just collateral damage. So I said, Trip, go find the nonprofit. He finds the nonprofit. He comes back. And I said, OK, write up your one page, because that's all you got is 30 seconds. So he says, uh, OK, comes back. And he's written the following. I'll try, I'll try and do it in less than 30 seconds. We're tight on a middle-aged black woman's face. And you don't see her mouth move. And what you hear is her voice. And she says, you look at me when I'm talking to you. You look at me. What was he to you seven years old and walking down the street and with a report card in his backpack with two A's? What was, you look at me when I'm talking to you. And you widen out, and it's a mother sitting at the funeral of her son. And it's one of those horrendous funerals where the coffin is so small that it only takes two people to lift it. And you dissolve from her to a young African-American man through bars sitting in a jail cell looking at the ground. That's the end of it. It goes to black, it goes silent, and a card comes up that 
says every bullet kills two mothers. That's it, straight out of Ryan's 20 year old mind. Mm -hmm. So if you're a producer, the next thing you think is now what will go wrong? Oh, we've got to get a woman who in 15 seconds can do this. So we're in talks and conversations, who have we got at the university? We haven't got anybody that's old enough that can do this, that's good enough. And we, 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 we're saying it's the Alfred Woodard kind of person. I'm sitting in a meeting with you next to me, and on the other side of me is Alfred Woodard, because this was at the academy on a foundation <laughs> meeting. And I thought, okay, this is life, thank you. So I, in, the, in the coffee break, I said, can you give me 30 seconds? And I pitched her the thing. She said, yeah, I'll do that. So Ryan, age 20, is now going to shoot at CBS a 30-second PSA that they had pledged to run thousands of times nationally. It might just change the world. It might save some lives. There you've got a corporation wanting to do good and the distribution of power. You have a young mind that cares about his world. And you've got Alfred in the street, if you like, saying, yeah, I'll help you. How can I help? Here I am. And That's why one should be optimistic, <laughs> not just Bonner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we have other uh, exciting news similar to what CBS, what you've arranged with CBS. Uh, UCLA is actually the recipient of um, the J. Ebert's Fellowship for Social Impact Film in Filmmaking which it comes from participant media to uh, six of our classmates over at the theater, film, um, and TV school at UCLA, where they get the opportunity to work for participants basically in a fellowship for a whole year upon graduating. Uh, those are graduate students, so anybody who's willing to hire us gets a real round of applause. Thank you to all of you. <laughs>